You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I hurt him. I let him down. I still live with the guilt, guilt of it. With what? Just things that I've done, things I shouldn't have done. And, um... Yeah. And then one day he came home. He came back and he said, oh... He, he, we, we were sort of losing a friendship. And he said to me, he said, Tony's jealous of our friendship. And I'm why? I didn't understand what he was saying then. But from what I can only gather from looking back on it for years, Tony just didn't like me. He just didn't like me. He, he wanted Pat's friendship for himself. He then walked me back down the uh, passage, down the hall, laid me on the bed, and I remember thinking, I won't see my sisters grow up and I won't be able to say goodbye to my girlfriend. That's all I kept thinking. Um, so it went on for however long. He was, he was kneeling over me with a gun in my head. And eventually he, he got off me, stood up, and I'm lying back on the bed still. And he pulled out a meat cleaver and he said, your hand or your foot. So I thought, well, if you take off my, my foot, I won't be able to chase you. If you cut off my hand, I can still shoot you. I thought, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you and that's it. So I shut my eyes, held out my right, held out my right arm. And I thought, it's gonna, I'm going to scream, I'm going to cry, it's going to hurt, but I'm going to kill you. That's all I kept thinking. And I was sitting there on the end of the bed, my arm held out, thinking, I'm gonna kill. that's all I kept thinking going through my head. I don't know how long that went on for. When I opened my eyes, Tony was looking at me with a meat cleaver raised. So I'm like in the alley, I've got the shotgun with me, I've like, it's loaded. It was a six shot or a five shot, whatever it was, I don't know. Um, so I put one in the chamber, thought, right, this is it, this is it. I was going to walk in behind them and just blow them to pieces. Malcolm, my mate who's dead, he, he phoned me and my dad up and said, There's, they're going to try and kidnap your sisters, um, cut their fingers off. My dad also, my dad had his contacts, his people, he heard it as well, that apparently they were going to kidnap. My youngest sister, Soph, at the time would have been five and Dawny would have been four. 14 or 15. Yeah, I phoned him up one night crying. I, um, I couldn't handle it. I really couldn't handle it. I, I had to protect my family. You know who done the murders of Pat, Tony and mm. Craig? Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Stevie Ellis. How are you, Steve? Right, sir. <laughs> First of all, thanks for coming on the show, Steve. You've made UK headlines, obviously uh, putting a name forward for the Essex Boys murdered, but we'll touch on later on in the interview. How are you, first of all? Fine. Yeah. I'm here. <laughs> I appreciate it. Hmm. Obviously, there's a lot of people talking just now, but before we get into all that, I always go back to the start of my guest, Steve. Where you grew up and how it all began. Um, what, right to the beginning? Where, yeah, right where, at the beginning. Uh, grew up just down the road in Lee. Um, little, little troublemaker around there. Surprised. Mm. I mean, trouble I used to do the burglaries, the thieving, just wouldn't get the money. Uh, How old were you? What, when I first started thieving? Yeah. Probably about nine. Stealing out the local supermarkets. Mm. And just stealing money, if I could. What was your upbringing like? good mum and dad dad left when i was four i was a daddy's boy worshipped him when he left apparently i used to i don't know wet the bed till i was god knows what age five or six screwed me head up but in them days you know you know today all these kids and they, they put a label on them like they got adhd or they got ocd or Bicola. they got god knows whatever yeah whatever it was i worshipped my dad he left when i was four and it screwed my head up I always wanted to be with my dad do you think that was the start of it i don't know he was a criminal so i wanted to be a criminal yeah. He used to tell me what he used to do, and I, to, I just wanted to be a criminal to impress my dad. That was what it was all about, in my opinion. What my about dad was my world. What about schooling? It was shit. Did you go? I was ill when I was uh, 10. I had leukaemia. When I was 11, I had testicular cancer. So I missed a lot of school. I, was, I had a wig that looked like a wig. I had a bald head because of all the treatment I had. This isn't a sob story. This is me, right? Um, I was just, just ill. And uh, so it caused me a lot of problems at school. I was obviously the smallest. They kept me back a year because I missed much school. This is not a sub story, all right? I'm just telling you. I missed a lot of school because I was in hospital a lot. I had a lot of treatment. Uh, all the other kids died for whatever reason. I didn't. doesn't mean I'm anything special. It just means whatever reason. Or like my dad used to say, God don't want you. So um, I just survived, but it caused me a lot of problems. I had retarded growth. 
mum thinks retarded mind. Um, I was just, life was just shit. You know what kids are like, they're all bullies. Yeah. You know, I used to get bullied for everything. I had really bad buck teeth, like I told you, I fold them down. Um, all the other kids were maturing, I wasn't. I was. I was used to be really embarrassed, we used to go swimming. And all the other kids have, have, have like hairy legs and hairy dick. You always look what someone else has got, don't you? And um, I just remember I used to go swimming and all the other kids were hairy. So one day I cut some hair off the back of my head, got a bit of super glue, stuck it on where it should have been pubes. Uh, next time we went swimming, I didn't feel quite so embarrassed, but until I took my trunks down. And uh, it looked like Hitler's moustache. So <laughs> looked really stupid. But I couldn't, I didn't know what pubes looked like. You can't yeah. stand there looking at pubes. <laughs> so I quickly yeah. went in the toilet, pulled them all off, or pull, pulled the bits of hair off. Yeah. I say it looked like Hitler's moustache. It looked mm-hmm. really stupid. So, um, <laughs> this <swimming> <laughs> yeah. And I had to skin it at the time. So, um, yeah. but that was it, you know. So I, I was just, to me, it was just a life of being embarrassed and being bullied. Yeah. But that's, that's do you know what? All it happens all the time. I'm nothing. Yeah, unusual. Man, all kids man. get bullied and picked yeah. on and it's just what kids are my dad that's what he passed away with leukemia so I know mm. the struggles that is to for it, this success rate it's not very great and mm. he got bone marrow knew loads of treatment hair fell out mm. and me seeing that never mind you going through it fucked with my mind and I mm. went down a dark road when I seen that big strong man deteriorate mm. and it fucked with my mind never mind a kid at 10 and then mm. getting cancer yeah, but I didn't understand it. Yeah. You know, I was a kid in hospital. My dad used to come and see me. I'd get toys. I'd get loads of ice creams. We couldn't eat no other food. I got attention off the nurses. And I remember I used to fancy the nurses. You know, I was a 10-year-old kid. Nurses, like, it was the attention. So to me, it wasn't, oh, you poor thing, you're dying. We used to get people come and see us. And, you know, what does a 10-year-old or 11-year-old child know about dying? Nothing, as far as I'm concerned. So what did I know about? I was in hospital. I got toys and presents. I got visits from my dad. He used to come and pick me up at the weekend or in the week. So to me, it was all about the attention I got. And you're ill. You don't understand you're being ill. So when these people say, oh, you're, you're a, what a hero they are getting this illness. No, you're not a hero. You're unlucky enough that you've been ill. It's just tough. Life is you're ill. There's nothing you can do. So when people are ill, oh, yeah, it's a shame they're ill, but they're not heroic. They didn't say, I know what, give me cancer. I want to be a hero. Give me cancer and I'll fight it. It's not. It's just tough luck. It's the way life is. And how, when did you get into recovery? What age? Oh, they cleared me when I was 16, I think. I'm sure I was 16, 15 so or five, 16. five, six-year battle. Yeah. So obviously, I'd, uh, when I did leukemia when I was 10, I had um, chemotherapy and radiation. When I was 11, I relapsed and it went to my testicles. Um, so I had uh, radiation and chemotherapy again. Um, I remember, uh, you know, it's just loads, loads of memories of it. Uh, all the kids were in the hospital. We, we were kids in hospital. We just, it's not poor me. It's just the way it was. Yeah. And because I, like I say, because I had all them troubles, it stopped me. With, uh, when I was 18, I was in Nick. No, I wasn't a liar. When I was 19, I was in Nick and I was five foot. They took my height. And just I was 19, I was in a guy's marsh. Um, and I was five foot when I was 19. So I was that small. I had these big buck teeth. Right, and so obviously everything was being bullied, especially Nick. Um, but that's just life. So I hate bullies. <laughs> Is that when you started growing a sort of hate for people? To st- what age did you start standing up for yourself? My, my mouth would always work, but I could never back it up. Um, and I remember Nick. I used to, the worst morning was I got three beatings in one morning. I don't mean a bloody good idea. I mean a few digs and that um, because I just wouldn't take the crap that I used to get. Um, so I would up t- track back. And of course, somebody would thump me, or I'd take the piss out of them to get back. Seeing you were in hospital and that, Steve, did you see a lot of other kids passing away who you'd yeah. become friends with? Yeah. I remember one morning, um, what was it, hang on. I, I was next to a kid called Barnaby. This isn't, how can I explain it? At that age, you don't understand, I didn't understand death, right? So one morning I know Barnaby had gone in the night, and the next day, Raymond, who was up the bed over the, over the wall, on the other side, two kids either side of me both went in two days. But you don't understand, I didn't understand it. Maybe other children of 11 and 12 do, but I was 11 or 12 and I didn't understand that they died. Yeah, they've died, okay. But it wasn't, you know, like now you've got a different idea and a different opinion of kids dying. It's, it's bad, isn't it? It's terrible. Yeah. It's a shame. I haven't got any children, I can't have kids because I tested the cancer. Mm-hmm. But um, it, I can't understand, you can't, I couldn't understand it then. All I knew, like I say, I was seeing my dad. To become kind of immune to it, did you, like, cold towards death? Like, did it even phase you because you were so used to seeing it and the pain? Like, you become very cold? 
I, I can't answer that. No. I can't say. I was 11 or 12. Yeah, still and young kid. What was it, when you first got to jail at nine, was that the first time you'd been in prison? When I was 18, yeah. What was that for? Uh, robbery and burglaries. I used to do, I'd never done houses. I never used to do houses if they were built and they were showrooms. So I'd break into the show house, steal the central eating, steal the bathroom and the kitchen. But I used to burgle shops, offices, factories. I know it's wrong, but I did it. I just wanted money. I wanted to be like my dad. Um, and then I wanted to go out and play pool one night. So I got a knife, went up and robbed the, lo- went up and tried to rob the local shop, went in the shop, with, cut the sleeve off, my, uh, off one of my jumpers, cut old eyes on, <laughs> eye holes in it. <coughs> Excuse me, went up the local shop, um, went in the shop with a knife, said to the woman, open the till. She ran to one other end. So I run down and I've heard her shouting, whatever her husband's name was. Whether I heard the dog or not, I don't know. She ran to one end of the shop. So I chased her again, opened the till, opened the till, she ran back, I chased her back, opened the till. In the end, I just panicked and ran off. Police come round the house about, round my mum's about two hours later. And when I was going out the door, I was pushing this, I used to collect knives, love knives, love them. And I had a big hunting knife I was putting up my sleeve to carry up the road. And as I walked in, my dad's, as I walked out, my dad's walking in. And he went, where are you going with that? I said, I'm going to sell it, dad. So apparently he's walked in and said to my mum, he's mad walking around with a knife, he's going to end up in trouble. So when the police came round a couple of hours later, they said, oh, we're nicking him for so-and-so. My mum went, what are you on about? He's done well, he's stuck to his curfew. And, they, and she said, oh, well, look, however long ago, somebody tried to rob the shop up the road with a big knife. And she went, oh, we did go out about then with a knife. And I was upstairs at that time with the old bill because they wanted to see my knife collection. And I heard it, the cop was heard it. I looked and went, well, worth it, was it? And they said, what wasn't? I said, trying to rob the shop. Oh, you admit it? Yeah, what's the point of denying it? So, got 27 months for that. <laughs> That was your, your first. Good old mum. <laughs> so she never realised that she'd stuck you in? Yeah, it doesn't matter, does it? What, did your dad it. come back into your life at that time? Yeah, I used to see my dad now and then. He used to come and visit me and Nick. So, What was your dad's past like? He was a criminal. Robberies? Uh, he told me he'd done a robbery when he was younger. He, he didn't get banged up after... He got banged up, I don't want to say, because um, he's dead, isn't he? Um, yeah, he got banged up out in Australia. He got nicked out in Australia. Um, he was just a criminal when he was younger. In and out yeah. of prison when he was a kid. He, he went first time he went in. He was eight. Young boy, man. Yeah, do preschool. You a, do you see a lot of yourself in your dad? I do. I worshipped him. He's my world, and I hurt him. I let him down. I still live with the guilt, guilt of it. With what? Just things I done, things I shouldn't have done, and. Um, Yeah, yeah. But Personal yeah. things. Yeah, a lot of regret then towards that. Sorry, a lot of regret. Yeah, regret and guilt. How did your mum act when you went to prison? My, my real mum. Yeah. Um, I don't think she was happy. Nah. <laughs> I used to cause a lot of problems. She used to get the old bill <clears throat> like coming round at regular time, not regular times, quite often to nick me for whatever. Did you ever get fairy parents, Steve, from everything that you'd went through from a young age? Did, did you I get what, sorry? Like therapy, like psychologists to try and oh, yeah, talk yeah. about it. Yeah. Did you have that at a young age? Um, first time I had it, I was... I think the first time I had it, I was due to go to court one morning for sentencing. And the night before, I went and done a vet's over, because I see a load of money in the till. My ex-girlfriend had a horse. And um, we went there and the, the, he charged her a fortune to get this horse fixed. Not, no, not fixed, um, whatever, give it treatment. There's a load of money in the till, and I thought, sorry, if I'm going down, I might as well get some money and leave us some money. So, um, no, it was, sorry, it was the day before I was due to go to court. So I'd done the vets over, took the cash tin that had some paperwork in it, just grabbed the cash tin, and somebody, it turns out there was a nurse on duty there. So, I, and when she came into the, where I was, when I was trying to find the, all the bits and pieces, and I was looking for the steroids as well, so I used to train, and vets, whatever steroids you get, chance I'll use them for vets and vet steroids. You know, medical for humans is used on yeah, animals and vice versa. And as well. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so I was going through getting the steroids. The nurse has come in, whether she was there already, I don't know, or whether she'd come in to treat the animals. So I just grabbed the cash tin. I don't think I grabbed any steroids, just grabbed the cash tin, grabbed the cash tin got away, went home, took all the money out of the uh, tin. And the rubbish hadn't been that day, or whatever it was in the morning, there was a black sack to be picked up. So I threw the crap in the black sack, and I thought, I think, whatever it was, the rubbish hadn't been collected, so I walked across the road and threw it in a skip. 
Well, the next morning, the, the builders turned up who Skip it was, seen the black bag in the Skip, pulled it out, opened it, and there's the papers from the vets. So he took it all the way across Swanage, so lived in Swanage then, give it, said, don't throw your rubbish in my Skip, threw it down on the top. They said, what are you on about? And there they see their papers and some of my papers. So the old bill came round again. Mm -hmm. And I was due to go up that next day for sentencing for doing over a garage, or trying to do in a garage. Uh, please come round. Um... Went, I got, went to court, uh, got remanded, sent to, uh, what's the name, whatever, some, um, Do Dorchester Nick. Um, my solicitor came to see me and said, obviously there's something wrong with you. Because <laughs> <laughs> no. you kept getting caught. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Did you ever think, right, okay, I keep getting caught here, I'm just going to pack it in? Yeah, I, got, I didn't get away with one crime, <laughs> honest. <laughs> Do you think there was a cry out for help to even not care, you didn't care if you got caught as well? No, I did care. Did you? Yeah, you used to... Just uh, not very good at it then? Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> when did you start getting into like, the series stuff, What Steve? series? Like shootings and stuff. When did you... When I didn't did... know it got me way to do it. I'd, I'd uh, um... Right, hang on, let me think here. Right, it was not... The police knew I had some guns, right? Um, so you went from knives to then to guns? Yeah, when I, was, when I was 18, I tried to rob the shop at the top of the road. Mm -hmm. and that weren't a good idea. So I got 27 months for that. I always wanted to have a gun. I worship McVicker. I didn't worship him. I love the film McVicker. Like, that I was a classic to... film. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, uh, the Who. Hang on. Uh, yeah, Roger Daltrey and um, Jimmy Boyle, in a sense yeah, of freedom. Yeah, yeah, They were my sort of heroes. They were like what I see my dad as a big gangster. And I always wanted guns. So got some guns. Um, I'm not saying anything else. <laughs> <laughs> when did um, like Pat come into your life, Pat Tate? I was in Nick in 1990. Got done for robbing a garage. With a knife, um, I didn't do it. Um, I got reminded. Me and my mate Malcolm, who's now dead, he Malcolm and I got done for robbing the garage. It was just a balls up. Uh, so Malcolm said to me, he said, "If you take, if you go, if you take a remand, I should get bail." He said, "Can you do that?" I went, "Yeah, fine, on," because it was my idea. What we, my idea was to get rid of some stuff that come from the robbery. Not that I knew where it came from. All right, mm. I'm totally innocent of the robbery. So anyway, um. Stupid thing, the stuff from the robbery, we decided, or I decided, we should take it somewhere and, and dump it. Anyway, where we took it, we took it to a private tip, not that I knew private tip, tips existed. Threw it in the river. It was, a suit, it was a briefcase full of papers. Now, I thought the briefcase full of papers would sink. <laughs> it didn't. It floated on the top of the river or on top of this puddle, whatever it was. Geezer's come round the corner in his bloody JCB or whatever because we'd driven on a private road. Fished it out with his frigging bucket. Of course, they got the number plate of the car, um, and me, my mate Malcolm, and his ex, his girlfriend, I don't think they were married then, got pulled in for it. Two guys robbed a garage with a knife. One had an Irish accent. Um, both Malcolm and I spoke English. We were both left-handed, and a guy had a knife in his right hand. So there was nothing on us. We had nothing to do with the flipping robbery. But I was given the stuff to get rid of. Somebody paid me some money to get rid of some stuff. Do you ever think about bundling stuff? That's what I should have done. I just <laughs> tried it in a bin. And it's just, funny about your heroes yeah. like uh, McVicker and mm. Jimmy Boyle, but each of them end up serving <laughs> lifers as yeah. well. I think you need to find I yourself new, new heroes, Steve. Mm. Um, so you end up getting done for that as well. Yeah, so I got reminded that was back in December '89, in and then in probably January '90, Pat Pat was in Chelmsford. It was Pat the first you would met anyone before uh, Tucker. Or, uh, yeah, Pat was. I met Pat in 1990. Um, I always wanted to do bodybuilding. I was a skinny little rat, always got bullied. Um, and I, you just think somebody with muscles is hard. Well, it's not, is it? You know, they're just a bit stronger. So I always tried to do, I always go down the gym, do loads of bench press, loads of bench press, loads of curls. That's all I knew. And Pat could see that I was enthusiastic and keen and he sort of gave me some advice. And then we sort of had a friendship form from there. Well, we didn't actually. He used to see me. Um, and in, in Nick, I always used to want to get a job so I'd get more gym. So um, I put my name down to go on the hot plate, uh, to go on the servery. And one day the PO, principal officer on the wing, called me down and he says, uh, you know your next come down on the servery, don't you? I went, yeah. He said, well, Pat Tate wants a job. I said, yeah. And he said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, my name's next, isn't it? He said, yeah. I said, well, I want the job. He said, what about Pat? I said, I want the job. So anyway, I, packed, I went up to my cell, got me um, bags, went down, got packed, moved down to the servery cell and Pat's walked in the door. And he used to call me Nipper then. I think he said when he started calling me Nipper. And he went, um, you know that I wanted this job? I went, yeah. 
So he's walked in the cell and he shut the door. He said, I wanted this job, this was my job. I went, no, I was next on the, I was next on the server, he said, it's my job. He went, well, all right, Nibba, fine. And he walked out. Anyway, he got the next job and that's where our sort of friendship formed. So he didn't try to bully you or anything or try to no, overpower no. you? Yeah, but like I say, on my mouth, I could never back up my mouth. He'd have torn me to pieces. Yeah. But he wasn't a bully. And I still say to this day, Pat was a good man till Tony got in his head and changed him and got him on the drugs. Was it Pat, Pat, was. Pat who gave you the name Nipper? Yeah. What's that from? Because I was a lot smaller than him. Was that? Nipper. <laughs> yeah. He was like 6'2", six six, probably about 6'2", Pat. So everybody would have been small to him, basically. Basically, yeah. yeah. He was. He, he literally, the screws used to, any problems on the wing when we was in Chelmsford, the screws would leave it to Pat, he'd sort them out. What about when you get out? What's your life like then? Um, when I got out then, I'd been in, I'd been with Pat, I was in Chelmsford for 15 months. So in that time, I trained. Did you friendship? Yeah, well, he got, he got, he got 10 years for a robbery. And, um, so he got convicted, but we was on remand together on the same wing. We were cells next door to each other. Cause he got the job on the survey after I got my job. Um, so we got banged up next door and, um, what happened? Yeah, we, we just, we just trained together. Um, we became good friends. Good friends. And uh, so when I got out, obviously I was a lot bigger. I went from nine stone three, I think I was, up to 12 stone. I've done gear, I've got some gear inside, some steroids. Um, and I put on a lot of weight. You only get out of steroids. People say, oh, steroids kill you. Well, yeah. You know, um, there's a few people who've died of steroids, but it's not really through doing loads of steroids. It's when bodybuilders, they do a thing called diuretics, that gets the water out of your body, called, increases your kidneys' production of urea, which you pee out. So your body loses a load of water. And it's, so you get more definition, right? Um, and it just makes you look bigger. So you try running a car without water in the radiator, the car will die, yeah? It says that. Well, same as people. If you do loads and loads of steroids and loads of growth and loads of frigging insulin and loads of diuretics, chances are you die. But I did steroids because I wanted to improve what I did down the gym. I wanted to be bigger. I wanted to be stronger. Um, and you only get out of them what you put into them. So I did a lot of training. My life in there was training. Like when I got out for many years, my life was training. Um, and so I come out, I was a lot bigger. Or, like us say, you think somebody's got muscle, you think they're a hard nut. But my thing was, I was bigger, so I didn't get bullied. People thought I could have backed up my mouth. Maybe I could, maybe I can't. But the fact is, I was a lot bigger, so I didn't get as much bullying. Did that make you more violent because you started putting on a bit of muscle? No, nah. I'm not violent. I'm not a violent person. What about then when Pat got out, did, did you two use team up straight away? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. When he, I got out in 91, I think it was March 91, because the robbery we was up for on the garage got thrown out. Um, the, the guy who owned the garage knew me, knew I was nothing to do with it, but he didn't know it was me when I got nicked, if you know what I mean. So he heard the names, but he didn't, he put, didn't put the name to the face. So Malcolm and I walked, got out of Nick. I walked out because I'd done 15 months on remand. I got a three-month sentence for handing stolen goods. I got out. Pat had been sentenced to 10 years uh, for a robbery. So I stayed in Pat. I used to go down and see him, uh, take his girlfriend Sarah to see him. We stayed in touch. Um, and when he got out in 90, what was it, 95, I think it was, he'd got Sarah pregnant. Sarah lived in a, a little one-bedroom flat then. I had a big three-bedroom flat. And uh, I said, Pat, well, come and stay with me. So he came to stay with me and we, we started a life of crime, which was great. What sort of stuff were you doing then? Um, <laughs> forged money. Uh, credit cards, selling drugs, robbing drug dealers, doing a community of service. <laughs> How was it taxing people? Did you feel safer with Pat there? Um, I don't know. Uh, you feel pretty safe when you've got a gun. Yeah. <laughs> when did it start going pear-shaped then? Or when did, sorry, when did uh, Tony come into your life? Um, Pat and I was doing a good... Pat had been out one night, from what I remember, obviously, you're going back 20 odd years, 25 yeah. years, from what I remember, Pat obviously had a key to my place because he was staying with me. And he came back one morning uh, and he said, oh, we'd seen this. I think what it was, Tony and Pat knew of each other, but they never had a friendship. Right? So one night, Pat had been out. Wherever he was, Tony was. And they sort of got talking. So Pat came back in the morning or whenever. And he said, oh, uh, I met Tony. He's a good guy, blah, blah, blah. He said, oh, we're going to go out with them. We're going to meet up. So uh, we went up to... Um, from what my memory serves me, I might be wrong. We went to the Epping Country. No, I can't remember. Whatever it was, at one point we went to an Epping Country Club, the Epping Country Club, and I'd always wanted to dance. Can't, still can't dance. 
So we'd gone to the Epping Country Club, me, Pat, and this, a friend of his called Ian, and Pat turned around to me and said, do you want to try an E? I was like, ooh, <laughs> all right, sod it. So I'd done an E. Um, after 20 minutes, my feet were sort of going. <laughs> <laughs> half an hour, I was at the side of the dance yeah. floor. Hour later, oh, half an hour, I was yeah. on the top, top I was on the off. stage, and I was the best dancer in the world. Mm. I was the best, and I loved it. And I remember then Tony came in with Colton, Colton Leach, another hooligan. Um, and this, Pat had said to me, just, you know, be normal, be sensible. But I was on the stage. Loving life. Loving it. I knew what I was born for then, popping knees and dancing. Mm. <laughs> so uh, that's when I met Tony and Colton. And how was that? When they, I've spoke to Calvin, he's been on the show. Mm. I actually rate Calvin. I think he's an okay guy. I think mm. he's a good guy. Um, done his thing and I think he's changed his life and he's doing his thing. Mm. How was that relationship built with yourself and Calvin? Um, it's just Calvin. It doesn't yeah. impress me who people are. It never has and it never will. Did you feel as if when you were taking drugs it was like an escape? Did you feel no, more alive? I, I did it stance. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I'm the best dancer. <laughs> <laughs> what I about it. how did you how did Tony accept you then? Um Pat and I still did our criminal sort of things, which I don't know how much he told Tony. I don't know. Um from what I remember one of the first times, Tony used to inject Coke, and so did Craig, who was Tony's little gopher. Um Pat and I, we were friends, and I'm sure we were. We I know we were, right? Tony and Craig, Craig was Tony's little gopher. If Tony wanted to sell some drugs, Craig would run it. So those two used to do gear, they used to inject coke. So he was around Tony's, uh, it was Tony's or Craig, I think it might have been Craig's actually, he was around Craig's one night and um, they did, uh, they had some coke in a syringe and they injected it. And I remember Tony injected Pat and Pat the next morning, I just walked out and Pat said, when Pat came, came in the next morning or whatever, the morning, um, morning, Day and a half later, he said, I could see the disgust on your face. I went, yeah, so why do you, why you got to stick a needle in yourself to get high? You, you cross a line then. I, I used to do a lot of coke. I was a bad cokehead years later. But I, I used to think about it. Is it a better buzz? But I never did it. I've stuck a needle in my ass for steroids, but I've never put a needle in my arm to, cr to do drugs. Yeah. You cross a line then. Yeah, I think I've, people smoking coke and snorting that. Mm. I've never seen anybody injecting it myself. Mm. Did you think about trying it because they were doing it? No, not at all. As in them days, I used to do a pill. I used to go out, do a pill. And in them days, it was, if you wanted a pill, it was, it was MDMA, it was ecstasy. Nowadays, it's a load of rubbish. Coke, yeah. load of rubbish. Oh, it's really good Coke. No, it's a load of rubbish. You're just paying more for it yeah. and you're still crap because there's so much money to be earned in it and people smash it to pieces. Do you feel as if all that mindset has changed then when they started injecting drugs and getting onto the more classes, bigger classes, then did that mindset start to change towards yourself? Um, yeah, I, just, I see what you're saying. Like I said, I walked out that night when Tony injected Craig. When they, when they got the swinges out and did it, it just wasn't a bit of me. So I left. Um, they became like birds of a feather. They were little junkies together. I don't know when uh, Pat started doing heroin, but from, from, from his post-mortem, there was heroin in him. All right? Um, so they injected coke then. Pat... Pat and Tony used to do a lot of coke. I would still be doing my pill, and Tony gave me some ketamine one night. He said, try that. He said, just do a little bit. He said, when, you, when you're up on ecstasy, just do a bit of that. So he gave me whatever he gave me, say half a gram. He said, just do a little bit. I did half it. I became a ball. You know them big silver balls? Yeah. I was one of them. <laughs> it's brilliant. Fantastic. Uh -huh. If you're on a pill and you do, I'm not saying do yeah, drugs. Right? Yeah, don't do drugs, I'm not kids. glorifying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm saying everything in moderation. Once a week, I'd go out. Do me pill, have a good dance. To me, it was great. It was also cardiovascular good dancing because I used to be right to my training. And uh, so he gave me this bit and all of a sudden I'd become one of the big silver balls spinning. It was fantastic. And uh, that was it. So I used to do a bit of ketamine. Uh, if you do it when you're down, it put you through the flipping floor. I did it once when I was normal and I literally left my body. It was not a good buzz. Uh, but when you're up, it's like having, if, you've got, if you're on a pill, it's like having 10 pills. How were you just functioning, get on jobs and that if you were getting high I wasn't doing it I was doing it once no, a week them with Pat and stuff coming with you Pat no Tony didn't come with us Tony was nothing to do with that no. that was mine and Pat's work and in them days we robbed a few drug dealers we sold drugs we did cards all the stuff that was just trying to earn a decent mm -hmm. living and of course we paid tax to who <laughs> the tax man <laughs> was there any <laughs> was there any consequences of the people you were taxing then or were they too scared to do anything um 
well, when we robbed drug dealers, we didn't exactly go, hi, I'm Steve and Pat from South yeah. End. You know, you smothered up, you got a gun, and that's just the way it is. It's dog eat dog in, them, mm-hmm. in that world. When did you start distancing yourself from them? Were you getting pushed aside or were you trying to leave them? Yeah, um, I was more sort of like, um, like I said, they became like birds of a feather. They wouldn't do your drugs, do, you know. I, I wanted to, if I was doing XC, great, but if they're injecting gear, that ain't nothing to do with me. And um, I remember Pat came in one, or I was in, I was cleaning the house once I had the flat. And I said, Pat lived with me. I was cleaning the flat, and in my wardrobe there was a plate uh, with some coke on it, or whatever. There was a coke, a straw. Or rolled up, no, whatever it was, and I just oh crystals, it was crack. He was he was he was doing crack, so it was in my wardrobe. So I threw it. I washed it down the sink. When he came in, he's gone nuts. I went, hang on, they're in my flat, in my wardrobe. I'm the one who gets freaking nicked. So he went he went bananas. I went, Excuse me, sorry. So we had an argument. I said bollocks, fats, uh, bollocks. I'm not going to swear because I don't like swearing. I said bollocks, pack, sod off. You don't like it, leave. I don't care. Don't bother me. Don't bring your crap in the house. It wasn't me being a hypocrite. I didn't want a load of drugs in the sodding house because if I got nicked, I'm the one who's going to go down for it, aren't I? I got nicked when I was 21 for uh, selling whiz. Um, so anyway, we, we started falling out like that. And then one day he came home, he came back and he said, oh, he, he, we, we were sort of losing the friendship. And he said to me, he said, Tony's jealous of our friendship. And I'm, why? I didn't understand what he was saying then. But from what I can only gather from looking back on it for years... Tony just didn't like me. He just didn't like me. He, he wanted Pat's friendship for himself. Pat was a false. He was a very powerful man. He was very... In the old days, a lot of people spoke highly of him, and I still speak highly of him. He was a good friend. He was a kind man with a good heart. Um, and Tony just obviously, obviously seen him as another false that he wanted around him. A bit like he used Colton. Colton was around him. Colton used to be a false. You know, Colton could command an army of men like that. I don't know what he can command now, but... You know. What about... Um did you have like abandonment issues when they, when he's not accepting you to be there? With who, sorry? Like Tony, when they were trying to like, push you to the side while he'll take part away from you, your friend who you've I grew a bond with? I don't think I really see it. I really don't think I see it. But like I say, Pat said to me one day, Tony's jealous about friendship. I'm just standing on the front step mm. talking to him and he came in and gave me a hug. And I was like, yeah, but Pat, you know, you, you, you're his friend sort of thing. Um, and then like afterwards, there's the classic case of I had my girlfriend, Louise. Tony was with Anna, but he used to have this girlfriend called Donna. Uh, Pat, Sarah knows, so it doesn't really matter me saying. Pat was running prostitutes. He'd shag different prostitutes and he'd have a favourite prostitute. So one Sunday night after we'd been out, or we'd been out the, fr- the Friday and the Saturday, Sunday night, I think it was, I was laying in bed. The phone rings, the landline, because we didn't have mobiles all the time then, obviously. Um, and it was Donna. Tony's second girlfriend. Tony lived with Anna. Anna knew about Donna. Donna knew about Anna. If Tony bought something for Anna, he would buy something less meaningful for Donna. That was the way he was. He thought he was some sort of mafia bloke who had all these different girls. So Donna's phoned me up. I said, oh, where's Tony? I said, well, he's at home, isn't he? Probably shagging the arse off Anna by now. Not being crude, but that's just what I said, and that's what I meant. Probably shagging the arse off his girlfriend. Um, that was on a Sunday. A week and a half later... Pat and I had to go for an ID parade. Sorry, I'm shaking with anger. Um, um, so we had to go for an ID parade because this guy had robbed one of um, Pat's prostitutes. They consider it a robbery if they have sex and the guy don't pay them. This guy had taken their money, taking a phone and everything. So Pat had to teach him a lesson. So we'd gone round. The guy fell over, hit his head a couple of times against Pat's fist. Because cause it was on a first floor flat, the people underneath heard the commotion, called the police. So as we're going down the stairs, I've opened the door and there's the old Bill. They went, oh, Steve Ellis, what are you doing here? And then Pat's walked behind them, they went, Pat Tate, and they moved aside. So Pat and I walked out. So anyway, uh, however long later, the police raided, nicked, raided my place, nicked me and Pat. We got charged with, I can't remember what it was, whatever, we had to go on an ID parade. So this morning... I'm waiting to go on the ID parade. Tony's walked in. Do you want to hear this? I've told this loads yeah, of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Tony's walked in with Pete Cuffey and Craig. Um, and Tony said to me, he said, uh, oh, blah, 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 where's the tool? It was a 2-2 revolver. I can't remember if it was Pat's or Tony's. It weren't mine, I don't think. Um, so I got it from where it was hiding. I had a cupboard under the stairs. And um, 
I said, "Yeah, Tony." I said, "It's clean. It's loaded. Be careful." With that, with his right hand, he, he whatever hand he put, he put a hand against my throat and started banging the gun into my head. And he kept going, "Shag my." He kept saying, "Fuck," but I'm not going to keep saying "fuck." I'm going to keep saying "shag." He goes, "Shag my bird up the arse." I'm going to show you what this can do. And he kept jabbing it in my head. And I honestly didn't have a flipping clue what he was referring to. I didn't know what was going on. All I know is I've got a gun in my nut that I know is loaded and I'm dead. It's as simple as that. That's what's going to happen. I'm going to get shot in the head. And I kept thinking, I just knew, I knew that I wouldn't feel it or see it because the bullet would go through him in the brain before I'm dead. So he kept banging on my head and he kept going, shag my bird up the arse, I'm going to show you what he's going to do. So he, then, he then walked me back down the uh, passage, down the hall, laid me on the bed and I remember thinking, I won't see my sisters grow up and I won't be able to say goodbye to my girlfriend. That's all I kept thinking. Um, so it went on for however long. He was, he was kneeling over me with a gun in my head. And eventually he, he got off me, stood up, and I'm lying back on the bed still. And he pulled out a meat cleaver. And he said, your hand or your foot. So I thought, well, if you take off my, my foot, I won't be able to chase you. If you cut off my hand, I can still shoot you. I thought, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you, and that's it. So I shut my eyes, held out my right held out my right arm and I thought it's gonna, I'm going to scream, I'm going to cry, it's going to hurt, but I'm going to kill you. That's all I kept thinking. And I was sitting there on the end of the bed, my arm held out, thinking I'm going to that's all I kept thinking going through my head. I don't know how long that went on for. When I opened my eyes, Tony was looking at me with a meat cleaver raised and he was, he was like frothing and his eyes were wild, so he was obviously out his nut. Um, so he's walked out the room. So as he's walked out the bedroom, I've got up and said to him, what the hell have I done? What's wrong, Tony? And he turned around, he lifted the meat cleaver and I just thought, do what you got to do. I thought he was going to smack me in the nut with it. Um, Pete Cuffey pushed me in the room. He said, just let him calm down. I said, what have I done? I haven't done anything. Um, anyway, they left. I went, to the, I went to the police station for the ID parade. The bloke was now convinced it wasn't me and it wasn't Pat, so we got, that got chucked out. I came out. Pat hadn't turned up for the ID parade, so I phoned Pat. I said, and he said, you're out of all the year, this year, that. I said, what are you on about? He said, you told Tony's bird that you, he shags Anna up the arse. I said, I never said that. And he said, what, you, you called? Um, he said, we'll talk to Tony. So I phoned Tony and I told him, and he said, what, you calling my girlfriend a liar? I went, no. He said, blah, blah, blah. I said, look, Tony, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, we come around later and sort it out. I said, well, do what you want. I won't be there. So with that, I got in the car, drove up to see someone, bought a bulletproof, bought a handgun. Um, didn't get a shotgun that day. And then uh, that night, I was too scared to go home. So I slept in the car in the morning. I went, went into my house. I'd, there's a big back alley that, that run the back of the houses in the, in the road I live and run the, run the back of the houses in the other road. And they was all in, interconnecting, like a big main artery with little um, veins coming off it. So I walked in the back door. I thought, something's not right. It turns out they'd been in, nicked my stuff. And um, it, was obviously, it was Tony, so I phoned him up. So I want my stuff and he was laughing. So I'm going to get you, Tony. I'm coming to get you. Or whatever I said. And it went on for a couple of days. Each night I was scared. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't go home. I was scared. I knew they were going to get me. It was just a matter of time. Well, I thought Pat, Tony was going to get me. And Pat and I wasn't talking then. I don't know what had happened. But anyway, one morning I was, dis I was tired of running scared. I was, I was scared of running. So rather than sleep in the car that night, I went in the back door. And you know I said about the... I lived on a ground floor flat, so there was the stairs going up the side. There was a cupboard under the stairs. So I got the shotgun, got my handgun. I was in the cupboard under the stairs. As soon as they walked in, I was going bang, 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 bang. That was the intention. Um, at some point in the night, I, got, I was under the stairs. I'd had enough. I got outstretched, sat on the bed, and I fell asleep. Obviously, no nothing. The first thing I know is the home phone's ringing, so I picked the phone up in my sleep. You know you pick your phone up, it's low. Mm -hmm. And it's Pat. I went, Pat, Pat, what's happening? He went, don't worry, Nipper. It's, it's all been a big mistake. He says, I, I got your staff tone. He's really sorry. There's been a big mistake. We know you didn't do anything, blah, 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 whatever. So I thought, no, he's being too nice. There's something wrong. Set up. Yeah. So I, I, I had a big bureau that I pushed against the front door. Um, went into the bathroom. I was splashing water on my face trying to wake up. And I thought, they're going to come. I'm sure they're going to come. So I run out the back door, down the alley, crossed the, crossed the road to a Volvo that I'd bought. I don't know why, I must have grabbed some more shotgun cartridges or some more, I don't know what I grabbed, but I run, as I run back across the road, uh, I went through a gate, shut the wooden gate and heard a screech of tyres. So I've looked through the wooden gate because it had slats, you know, like um, just a slat yeah. wooden gate. 
and it was Tony or Pat's Porsche. They both had a black 928S. So as I've looked through, I could see Pat, to Pat and Tony jump out and Craig follow them. I could hear the kicking of the front door, because obviously I'd pushed the bureau against the front door, and you could hear them kicking it to kick the door open. So I'm like in the alley, I've got the shotgun with me, I've like, it's loaded, it was a six shot or a five shot, whatever it was, I don't know. Um, so I put one in the chamber, thought, right, this is it, this is it. I was going to walk in behind them and just blam to pieces. Were you scared? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was scared. I was like, uh, adrenaline. Adrenaline. Yeah. So I thought, That's, this is it, my, my time. So as I've opened the, it was a catch on the door, catch on the gate. Sorry, I'm moving about the microphone. That's anyway. okay. As I opened the catch and opened the door, to, to get, I had the shotgun with me. They, I see Pat and Tony come running out. They looked up and down the road. Um, and uh, then they got in the car. So obviously, as I see them running out, I shut the gate. Didn't have the surprise on them. Um, but I was still looking through it. They got in the car, drove down the road. And then I, I presume I was still waiting there because I'm sure they drove back up the road. I went in, I went through the alley in my back door. And where the bureau was, there was a notepad and it said on it... Um, Nipper, what's your problem? I'm your friend, Pat. So I phoned him up. He said, Nipper, where were you? I said, I'll see you. He said, what are you on about? He said, I'll see you come to my door, you piece. Whatever I said, I said, I'm coming for you now, Pat. And then we had an argument. Phones was hung up. And then like, I was then out hunting for the three of them. And how was that then? With your friend, doing a bit of bird with him, um, and then becoming enemies? Because I know you you always speak highly of Pat. Hmm? So how did that affect you? Did it hurt you? I don't know. I just know they'd come to get me. Well, how do you know they weren't trying to sort it? And if it was just a oh, yeah, right, okay, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, sorry, the, yeah. the first time when they came to your door and right. Pat left, I know. Do you think that was just being nice to set you up? Or do you think Pat had phoned me and said, Pat, yeah, so that phone call when they woke me up, they said, We've got to go to London this morning, but we come around and see you this afternoon. Sorry, I forgot to say that, right? Mm. So, like I say, I put the phone down, pushed the bureau against the front door. You had the porch and then you my front door, which I pushed the bureau against my front door. Um, and I thought he was being too nice. So when I phoned him and he said, I see you, he said, yeah, we was going to go to South End, but, uh, sorry, we was going to go to London this morning, but we thought we'd come around and see you, sort it out. I went, bollocks, Pat. I said, you was after me. There's no way you kick that door and you come around that quick. Was you coming around to talk to me? I said, so we had an argument. And the last thing, probably the last words I said to him that day was, I'm coming for you as well now, Pat. And then we had this argument and that was it. Phones were hung up. And that was at the start of from there? Yeah. Who did you yeah. try and shoot first? Was it Pat? Yeah, it was packed because I used to drive around. I'd, um, I had the problems with them, and then, however long later, um, Malcolm, my mate who's dead, he he phoned me and my dad up and said, There's, they're going to try and kidnap your sisters, um, cut their fingers off. My dad also, my dad had his contacts, his people, he heard it as well that apparently they were going to kidnap. My youngest sister, Soph, at the time would have been five, and Dawny would have been 14 or 15. Now, we didn't know which one they was after. My other two sisters, Lindsay was wherever, and Natalie, I don't think they'd have gone for Natalie. She had a boyfriend, and I think she was all right. So we because they knew where my dad lived, with my, my stepmom and my two sisters, we assumed it was going to be them. So my stepmom got Sophie out of nursery school, and then I had a shotgun. I didn't have a pump with me. I had a, I had a shotgun. My dad had a shotgun. I went to the back gate of the school. My dad, my stepmom went to the, the front gate of the school, and my stepmom went and got Dawny out of school. Well, I was obviously standing on guard at the back of the school. My dad was on guard at the front. Um, got the girls out of school, got in the uh, car, just drove. They went into they went went into a hotel up near Colchester. I followed them up there, sort of like. And um, so then it just went crazy. They they was after my family. How was that for you mentally? Screwed me up. Be taking drugs and that then? No, no, not at all. You just try to stay sane. I, I I used to go out on a weekend and do one um, pill apart from one night when we was at a party. Pat, uh, not Pat, sorry, Tony gave me a pill, which I wasn't even aware of it. I just took this pill and I, I'd blacked out until the morning when I came round. We was in my flat partying, but I wasn't I wasn't into drugs. In mm -hmm. didn't interest me. Um, so what was the uh, what was that the the steps after that when you tried to shoot Pat? Was that in your intentions to kill Pat? Yeah, it was my intention to kill them all. How was, how was that, though, about being the friendship? Did you just go on straight away as soon as they started threatening your family? Um, I just got my family out of town, and then like, I'd drive from Pat's to Tony's to my sister's to my dad's to mine to Tony's. I just drive around looking for them. And one night, um, as I drove around, to, I see Pat. By then, we'd done some drug dealers, got a lot of money. 
Pat had bought a place. So him and this, him and Sarah were moving into this bungalow that he was getting done up. So I knew where the bungalow was, obviously. So I drove around, I see his car outside the bungalow. So I was with my girlfriend at the time. And I said, I've got to drop you off. So I took her back to South End. Went back to Vange or near ba- Vange near Basden. Had the ha- I had a handgun with me. You want to hear this again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you know how many times I told this story? <laughs> 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 so anyway, um, I walked up, I walked, I climbed down to the railways, walked along the railway track, up behind Pat's bungalow. Um, so on the left from the back, you had, I think it was a dining room. In the middle was the uh, bathroom, and on the right was the kitchen, and the, the bathroom lights on. And you could see Pat in there. He was massive. You couldn't miss him. So he was in this frosted glass uh, bathroom having a shave, as it turned out. Um, so I got a brick because I wanted to make sh- Pat. Sarah was there. And by then she had um, Jordan, Pat's son. So I threw the brick through the window to make sure that Pat was by himself. I wanted to shoot Pat. No one else. All I knew was I had to empty the gun into him. That's all I knew I had to do. So the window smashed. I lifted the gun up. Gone. In my mind, I was pulling the trigger. He's running and he screamed. So as he's, as he's run, he's run from, I knew the, it was an L-shape, the, the bathroom. So he's run out the door and he's run towards the kitchen. So I've run from the, the bathroom window to the kitchen window, I've seen him, I've gone putting the trigger again. He's seen me run off, because the lights were on, the house was all lit up. He's seen me, so he's run back. And I thought he was going to run through the uh, hallway and out the front door. So I run to the front, I run down the side of the house, at the front, at the side of the house, Held up the trigger, held up the gun. I was waiting for him to come out. I was going to pull the trigger on him. But he didn't. All I heard was, please, please, I've been shot, I've been shot. So straight away, Sarah was screaming. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> Scared her. Um, so I, I just ran off straight down the um, railway lines again, got in my car and drove off. Um, that was Pat. A uh, couple of nights later, I was hunting. Going, oh, he. there's loads of stories here. Right, so um, in the day... A couple of days later, I was driving, sorry, a couple of days later, I was driving around once again, still looking, Pat was in hospital now, bullet in his arm, it, it smashed his arm, it turns out, shame of it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you about the gun in a minute. Um, so there I was driving around from my place to Tony's, to my dad's, to, to whatever, trying to find him. And I see Tony and Craig walking up the big alley at the back of my house. So I phoned up my dad and I said, dad, get the shotgun down here, I need the shotgun. And he went, what? I just said, get the shotgun. So he, but he came down with the shotgun. By the time he got down, so he wouldn't have been in hiding then, would he? He wouldn't have been in bloody in the hotel. See, events in my mind are a bit mm. not clear. Yeah. Bit. How was it then when you tried to shoot him and you missed? Did that uh, make you more fearful or did you think, no, oh, I need to no, go full steam ahead here? There was a problem with the gun. You know, I said when I put the gun through the window and I pulled the trigger. Yeah. That the, the um, I presume, you, you know what a gun's like, the hammer hits the percussion yeah, cap, yeah, sends the bullet off. Through. Yeah, there was something wrong which I didn't know at the time, there was something, something wrong with the gun. It wasn't the hammer that hit the percussion cap. The hammer hit a bit of metal that was on a pivot that had a nipple on it that hit the percussion cap, but the pivot, the nipple was worn. So when I've gone like that, bang, bang, or thinking I was going bang, 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 the first, when I got home after I, tried, after I shot Pat the first time, the first time Pat got shot, not the first time I shot Pat, um, two of the bullets on the percussion caps had dents on them. So it turns out I'd obviously f- pulled the trigger three times when I tried shooting through the window, um, and it was the third bullet that smashed into his arm. Uh, so anyway, my dad got the shotgun down. When I walked up the alley, I could hear this banging of metal on metal, which at the time I didn't know about was them trying to smash the D-lock off my motorbike. So I'm walking up, I'm hearing this banging metal on metal. All of a sudden, Tony and Craig walked, walked out from behind my fence, and Craig was carrying all my motorbike levers and... Um, I had two motorbike level sets with helmets. So for whatever reason, I hit, I run behind another fence and I had the handgun in my hand. The shotgun I had over me on a bit of rope. The shotgun was hanging down. So um, Tony's walked out and he's got a nipper. I went, fucking nipper. Lifted up the gun, pulled the trigger. It didn't go off. I still had the same gun at the time that had a problem with, with the nipple and thing. So I pulled the trigger and it didn't go off. So I'm looking at the gun and I've seen Tony, he sort of like crouched down going, ah, 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 like that. Um, so he seen me looking at the gun, stood up. He went, Nip, I'm going to get you. I went, you all right? I lifted up the gun, pulled the trigger. This time the bullet went, it fired, the bullet went, where it went, I don't know. 
they've started running. I pulled out the pump action and I'm chasing him through the alley trying to put in the trigger, but I'd taken the safety off. So we've run through this alley. They've gone, um, they're running away from me. As I've come out onto the road, it was a school. There was mums and dad, well, mainly mums collecting their children from school, which I didn't even know was there. So I put the shotgun back down, um, turned around and walked back off, walked back to where I'd thrown the handgun down, picked the handgun up and quickly got back to my car. Um, my dad was parked around the corner, as it turns out. He see Tony and Craig come running over, jumped in their car. Um, they, basically, they went up to Basildon Hospital where Pat was. Sarah had phoned me up. Sarah phoned me up later the next day, or later that day, sorry, and said, oh, Tony walked in the hospital saying, oh, Nipper tried to shoot us, Nipper tried to do this and that, laughing, not mentioning he was on the floor crapping himself. She said, be careful, they're planning to get you. Why did she give you the heads up? Because Pat was a bastard. Because she's scared it, of Pat. Yeah, yeah. She came round. You know, I said he was running prostitutes. Sarah came round to my place one day. Pat was in bed with a prostitute, so she's walked. I said Sarah's here, so she's come up to the door. I couldn't not answer the door. Sarah's come in. Um, the prostitute, whatever her name was, I don't know. Girl, let's say the lady, girl, whatever she was or is. Hid in some other room. Sarah's gone back to where she knew Pat's bedroom was. And she, next minute, all I've seen is Sarah come running down the hall, had a long hall, with Pat behind her trying to hit her. So I've just jumped in front of Pat for what little use it done. It delayed him that long that Sarah managed to get away. Um, Sarah's a good girl. She's a nice girl. Did she want them dead? Not as far as I know. <laughs> no, but if she hated them that much, then terrified. I don't think she hated him. I, I, I don't know. I can't speak yeah. for Sarah. Um, so How I do just, you think Pat would have felt if he knew Sarah had phoned you? Oh, she, well, she, when she phoned me, she said, don't tell Petty, kill me. I met Sarah up at um, Lakeside and we had a chat and she said, basically, they're trying to get people to kill you. So I think it was that night I would decide to go and kill Tony. So I have drove around, I had the pump action and I had a handgun with me, the same handgun, I didn't change it then. So I drove, Tony lived on Chafford 100 Estate, big estate, um, new houses, so I was driving, drive, drove around there and I needed a wee. My plan was he had a big front door with big glass in it. My plan was to ring the bell as he comes to the door, bang, 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 through the glass. Seems to be a habit of mine, doesn't it? <laughs> or it tried to be. Um, so I, before I went to shoot him, I needed a wee. And like I said, it's a big new housing estate, so I needed a wee. So I parked up, had a wee in an alleyway next to a house that was being built and there was a, there was a security guard there, which I hadn't seen. Um, as I finished having my wee, Gone back to the car and he said, what are you doing? I said, I went for a wee, mate, blah, blah, blah. He said, well, what are you doing around here? I said, I'm going to see a friend of mine who lives in whatever the name of Tony's Road was. So he said, oh, he said, what you got in the car? And I was just thinking, shit, the shotgun or the handgun. I can't remember what it was. I think I was worried about the handgun, how shiny it was. It was on the passenger seat. So I've jumped in the car and locked the, locked the door and he shined his torch in and he's in his seat again. He said, what's, yeah, it was, it was the handgun. Um, and he's seen the gun and I said, oh, it's a starting pistol. He went, show me. I said, no, I can't show you. I can't show you it. So I'm trying to start the car. Oh, Volvo. And it's flooded, whatever it was. So he's trying to open the doors of the Volvo. It was a Volvo estate. He's gone to the back, to the boot, opened the boot. And I'm trying to start the car that's flooded. So now I put it in gear, trying to jump start it because it was on a slight decline. Trying to get its bump start. So it wouldn't start. It wouldn't start. I finally got to the bottom of the hill. It miraculously, it started. I've slammed it in reverse. As I've slammed it in reverse, I had the boot shut. And he was running up the hill. I was struggling to get up the hill because it was still mud. When I got to the top of the hill, he was there. I drove at him, not drove at him, intentionally to hurt him, to get away. He's got a big scaffold bar, smashed it on, tried, he smashed it on the screen, the screen didn't bust. Um, and that was the end of my, I just shot off quickly and um, phoned someone up, said, I dumped the guns, I phoned someone up, I phoned someone up, come and get the guns, I need the guns picked up. Mm -hmm. um, and I drove off, didn't get my chance to shoot Tony then. But then... What happened? Oh, yes. Yeah, so then a couple of days later, I'd say a couple of days, the time scale, I can't get my head around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a couple of days later, I was up, because Sarah had said Tony had gone to visit Pat in hospital. Os I sound like a common, I don't know. Hospital, right? Because <laughs> Sarah had sa said that Tony had gone to visit Pat in hospital, I decided to get Tony at the hospital. So one night I'm at the hospital, and like, like I say to everyone, I don't know if it was from Terminator where he had a shotgun over his shoulder and a bit of rope, but I had, I had it like that. So I don't know if I copied him or someone that copied me, whatever, somebody copied someone. So I had the shotgun and I was waiting outside the hospital near the main entrance. 
and I'm there and I've heard someone's or someone said, Steve, I turned around, it's my mate. I'm not saying his name. He said, what the hell are you doing here? I said, Tucker, lifting up a shotgun, like, Tucker. He went, you're crazy, there's armed old Bill everywhere looking for you. He said, Pat's grassed you up, Tony's grassed you up. Tony and Craig grassed me up for trying to shoot them behind my place. Pat had grassed me up for shooting him. He said, get the hell out of here. Did they grass you up? Yeah, they made statements. Did they? Yeah. Did Pat get done for a gun under his pillow? Yes. When you That was my him? gun. That was my gun, the bastard. We'd done some drug dealers over and I left the gun at where I left the gun. So when I shot Pat, the first time Pat got shot, I shot him. Because people think, oh, so you shot him twice. I went, no, unfortunately I didn't. Um, I left the gun there. So the person whose place I left the gun around, give it to Pat, because he phoned up and said, I need a gun. Steve's going to come and get me in hospital. Which was, funnily enough, I wasn't going to get him. I was going to get Tony. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> yeah, so when he got done for under the gun, under <coughs> Excuse his me. Pillow, oh yeah, he got done. Did he get sentenced for that? Yeah, he got recalled. Did he they? got a recall back to Nick because he got out. Do? Oh, I don't know, less than a year. So when you were going through all this with them, how long after it when they got murdered in uh, 1995? I, I got 15 months. I got a right result. The police put in a good word for me. Not because I'm a wrong one, mm -hmm. but because the police knew exactly what happened. Everyone knew what was happening between me, Pat and Tony. Everyone. When I got nicked... What did um, you get nicked for? Attempt murder? Uh, three attempted murders. Did, so, was their statements go against you at court? Or did right, you what happened it? was I got nicked for three attempted murders... Armed old Bill nicked me, I had a gun down, I had a, I had a different gun. Not the one I shot Pat with, I had a different gun, I got that changed. Yeah, I should fucking think so, man, the amount of things you used. <laughs> Otherwise I'll know. still be inside. It was bloody useless, you couldn't shoot anyone with it, it was crap. <laughs> Did you never try and get them fixed? If you knew yeah. that you needed to do the job right? Because if you kept missing, then that just puts more pressure on yourself and your family. Um, I didn't go out of my way to miss. I mean, people say, oh yeah, you can't shoot properly, but I hit a moving elbow... <laughs> about 15 foot so Pat was running away from it it's just that you put the gun bang 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 that's all I did at the time I couldn't trust anyone I couldn't go to people because I was then Tony had something like 100 odd doorman Pat had a lot of friends there was a lot of people in South End who knew what was happening I was getting phone calls right? and I didn't know who I could trust many Osmonds did you have? How many got three? What Osmonds did you get any threats to life to, to, please come to you and say look there's a hit out in your life no not then no nah. no nah. So you went to prison, so after the shootings, you got 15 months, Pat got recalled. Were you ever in any danger inside prison? Um, when I first got nicked for shooting Pat, like so I got nicked for three attempted murders. The gun? Yeah, I got yeah possession of a loaded gun in a public place with intent to endanger life. Possession of a loaded gun, uh, sorry, possession of a gun in breach of firearms, ban. Possession of ammunition in breach of firearms, ban. I also had driving licence and dodgy money on me when the old Bill nicked me. So I've gone to court. There was a closed call for whatever reason. I think because there was threats out on my life, but it sounds a bit weird. Anyway, in court, my dad was there and so was my mate Malcolm, who's now dead, Mountain Walsh, great mate. Miss him all the time. Malcolm had a recorder, a tape recorder in them days it would have been. And the prosecution stood up and said, Pat Tate knows it was Stephen Ellis who shot him and he's confident he can pick him out on an ID parade. Tony Tucker knows it was Pat Stephen Ellis who tried to shoot him and he's confident he can pick him out on an ID parade. Craig Rolfe... Knows it was Stephen Ellis. So all three of them had made dimming statements. Malcolm recorded this on his recorder. When he left the court, because he got in with my dad and he said he was my brother. I mean, if anyone who knew Malcolm and I weren't brothers, but he's best mate. So anyway, when I got remanded, Malcolm got out the recording of the prosecution saying all three grasped me up. So when that got out, apparently all three of them withdrew their statements. By then I was banged up in Chelmsford because I got caught with a gun, obviously. My story was that I had the gun. I wasn't going to shoot anyone. I was just going to blow my own head off. I did have trouble with people, but I wasn't going to say who. But the police, when I got nicked, they told me everything that happened that morning in my flat. You know when I said they, Tony was banging the gun in my nut and there was, there was Craig and there was uh, Pat and Tony? No, Craig, Tony and Pete, right? They knew everything. They knew him, me giving them the gun. They knew me being literally lifted off the floor and pushed down there, down the hall, in the bedroom. They knew everything. And I said, look, I've got problems with people, but I'm not saying who. I'm not going to tell anyone who the problems are. But I had the gun, I was going to blow my head off. Right, it's as simple as that. I wasn't going to shoot anyone. Because in my mind, I thought, well, hang on, if I'm going to kill myself, I'm not guilty of it. They, they nicked me for a tent to endanger your life. Well, so of course, you want to get off, don't you? You're banged up, you want to get out. So you, you're nuts, you start thinking. And I thought, right, fine, I was going to blow my own head off. That's it. That's my story, I'll stick to it. 
So when those three withdrew their statements and I stuck to my story, all they'd done was in the end, I went to court for possession of a loaded firearm. No, sorry, they dropped that. Possession of a firearm in breach of the firearms ban. Possession of ammunition. They didn't bother doing me for the I'd blank driving licenses and the forged money. So I went to court. I should have got three or four years. The old Bill knew what was happening. Everyone knew what was sodding happening. I had police come up to my cell. Half a dozen probably said, good on you, Ellis. Well done, Ellis. Well done, Ellis. Nice one. One cop said, why don't you use an elephant gun on them pieces of shit? The police, when they interviewed me, said, look, we know you shot him. We don't care. We're just doing our job. But if ballistics comes back and proves it, we're going to nick you. So don't do it. Because I didn't have the gun. And obviously, you're going to mm. stick to your story, aren't you? When you were going through all that as well, the pressure, because did you ask Carlton Leach to kill you? Yeah, yeah. Was that the pressure just too much yeah. of everything? Yeah, I phoned him on? up one night crying. I um, I couldn't handle it. I really couldn't handle it. I, I had to protect my family. So I, I, I forgot about it till someone said, oh, um, Carlton did his book. And I said, don't pop my name in it, Carlton. I don't want the, I don't want to, I'm not interested. So somebody said to me, they've seen, they read his book or he's seen the film and in it, it said about, oh, um, Steve Ellis, I should shoot him. And I did, I phoned him up crying. I said, Carlton, I can't do it. I knew the only way to save my family was if I died. Um, so I phoned him up and said, look, I can't do it. I can't remember if I sat there and put, I don't think I put the gun in my head and attempted it. I don't think I was that, whatever. But I knew I had to die. So I phoned Colton up and said, Colton, can you put a bullet in my head? He went, why? And I told him and he, I said, they're on my family, they're trying to get my family. And he said, I don't agree with that. He said, I'll talk to them. Um, and he said, call me back or whatever. So I phoned you back later. And he said, they're going to leave your family alone. And he said, but you've got to leave town. <laughs> like Western, isn't it? So um, he said, and if they catch you. Look, I, there's different stories in my head. I'm sure, basically, I said to Carlton, tell him. I'm sure he said, they take your arms and legs off. So we tell him, if they take my arms and legs off, I'll still have a frigging grenade. A friend of mine had a grenade. He's going to give me a grenade. And I was going to basically wait outside Tony's. When he comes out in the car, bang, 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 windows were and I'd thrown a grenade in the car, so if I didn't kill him with a shotgun, I'd have killed him with a grenade. So um, I said, well, tell them if they take my arms and legs off, I'll have a grenade and I'll wheel, in my wheelchair, I'll wheel up to them and let the grenade off and I'll, I'll die with them. I lived to kill them. I lived to kill them and that was what I lived for. When when Pat, Tony and Craig get killed in 95, where were you? I was out that night, but I wasn't there, unfortunately. I, I didn't even... As I've told this, you want to hear the story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your story, right. Um, right, first of all, there's three police that have re recently made a, um, a, a film or made a statement saying there was no evidence against my dad. <laughs> yeah, obviously, because my dad never got nicked. If there was evidence, they'd have called him in. Mm -hmm. My dad told me, I was out that night, I'm, I was trying to nick something, uh, probably a lorry or something. That's what I used to do, I like, like nicking lorry loads of gear. So I was out that night, I didn't have the mobile phone with me. When I got home, there was a missed call from my dad. So whatever time I got back, I can't remember if it was 10, 11, whatever. Um, there was a missed call. I thought, I won't phone him back. I'll call him in the morning. So the next morning, the phone's rung. Now, I've got these times six or seven in my head. It might have been seven or eight. I can't remember what flipping time it was. But I remember the phone rang and I was asleep. I'm not, I don't sleep until late. So I've answered the phone and he's going, they're dead, they're dead. Uh, they're dead. They're dead. And he's laughing. I'm like, what are you on about, Dad? And he said, he said, Pat, Tony and Pete are dead. Pete Cuff, Pete Cuffy. Pat, obviously Pat, Tony and Pete Cuffy, not Craig Ralph. I said, Dad, what are you on about? He said, they're dead, they're dead. And I, I think I started crying. I said, Dad, what have you done? He went, don't worry, no one knows. Not even your stepmom knows. He said, nobody knows. I said, Dad, and I was, I was crying. What the hell have you done? Um, turned around, we're talking and I said, I'll call you back. So I think I went down the... Might be wrong. I think I went down the phone box then and spoke to him. And he was saying Pat, Tony and Pete. And I couldn't believe it. So all that day, I was listening to the radio. And I th it was either 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. These are the numbers I've got in my mind. I don't know why. I'm probably totally wrong. It was the first time I heard it announced on the news that day, that night. Obviously, the next... If they got killed at night, right, it was the next night I heard it on the news. They didn't get found till the morning of the... What was it the 8th, wasn't it? Six, I can't remember the frigging date. Um, they got whatever morning they got found on, it wasn't announced on the news until later that night. Now, on the news, they said 
Pat, Tony and Craig. Obviously, my dad had got it wrong, right? He, but he didn't know Pete and he didn't know Craig. So people, uh, people say, do you believe your dad done it? And I'm like, well, like my sister as well. Those police who released that story, they spoke to my sister. My sister, I'm not going to say her name. Um, and she said, yes, dad told us in the morning. Now, my, my dad knew about it early in the morning. My sister, Natalie, he phoned my... Oh, I've just said a name. Mm-hmm. Right? My sister, that. I wasn't going to say a name. It don't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's fine. Um, she got told in the morning as well. Um, people say, do you believe it? I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it, even though they screwed up my life so much, so yeah. bad. So over the last 20 years, there's been two men in prison for the Essex Boys murders. I know, um, for Matt a fact, Steele they didn't do it. Yeah. And um, John, John, Wombs. John Wombs. Jack Wombs, sorry. So sorry, Jack. you know who done the murders of Pat, Tony and mm. Craig? Who was it that done the murders? And, um, uh, yeah, so... Yeah, so, well, my dad, look, he, he said, this story that the free police released, right, they said there was a guy who walked down a back alley, or not down a back alley, across the field and through the back gate, right, killed the guys. This guy was someone, Jasper, I can't remember his name. Billy Jasper. If that's what his name is. So when this story came out from the free police, people said, well, did your, did your dad know Billy Jasper? I'm like, I don't know. I've got my friends. If you say to me, um, if I tell about a crime I committed, I, I talk about Malcolm, right? I've done crimes with other people, but they're still alive. So I'm not going to tell you their names. My dad had his, his criminal little, like say he was banged up at eight. He was wanting to prove score at the age of eight. He'd done bird up until he was like in the mid twenties, in and out, in and out, in and out. Like I used to be being a wally. So he had his, I don't know who he knew. He, I know he had friends up near, um, oh, near Chafford 100. I know he had friends, Further on, he had loads of friends in different places. Say did, loads. He, did he ever admit to you that he'd done it? He said he'd done it. And what was going through your mind when you found out that we're dead? I couldn't believe it. I, I really couldn't. I was frightened what he'd done. I really was frightened what my dad had done. Um, I was crying. Yeah, I was crying. Were you close to um, Jack Worms or Mick Steele? No. Did you know them? Are you not worried you, get, you could get done for perverting the coast of justice? No, because I, I, look, I didn't, when I was living down in Bournemouth at the time, when their solicitor come, when I found out Mick and Jack had been nicked, their solicitor come to see me, wanted to know everything, obviously, and I said, look, I will stand in court and swear black was blue, it was me who did it, right, to get them off, right, to get them off. Uh, what, I, I just knew they was innocent, right, and I would have stood in court and swear it was me that had done it. Then you've got to prove it, haven't you? You know, okay, so we're nicking you for it. Fine, nick me. I wanted to have killed... I wish I'd been there that night because I would have made them pieces of shit suffer. I, I, I had this dream of nailing to them to the floor through the knees and elbows and then flaying them, cutting their skin off with a knife. Just slow death, right? I wanted to kill them. I wanted to torture them, right? For what they put me and my family through. I, um, I didn't. I, I wish it had been me. It had been me. I was frightened what my dad had done. I didn't want my dad getting banged up. I didn't want my dad getting retaliation. There was loads of other crap that he was suffering from, my family was suffering from. And to know them, to know that, to know they were dead, how could I accept it? How could I believe it? I don't flipping know. Is that why you live with a lot of regret because your dad done it and you didn't? Um, what I put them through. I didn't intentionally put them through that. My dad and my stepmom and my sisters, I didn't intentionally put them through that. It was just something that went wrong and it escalated. My, there was a time when we'd done some dealers over, my, my dad was looking after 10 grand of pats, right? So when it had all gone pear shaped, obviously I told my dad, and he said, well, Pat's been on the phone, he wants his money. So then I said, I'll come round, dad. And he went, no. So he had a garage, he was in the garage and he had a shotgun and he had the, mon- he had the shotgun in a Wellington. This is what he told me afterwards. He didn't know. He, I, I think he told me after Pat had been round because I wasn't because I said I'd come round, but it already. I think he told me after Pat had taken the money. So Tony and Craig had pulled up. Pat had gone into the garage. The garage door was open, and Pat had said to my dad, "You got something in mind?" He went, "Yeah, your money's there." The money was at the front of the garage. My dad was sitting in the back of the garage with a pump action. No, he had, I don't know if he had a pump action or just a shotgun in the Wellington that he would have pulled out and just shot him if it started with. Right, so my dad had to do these things. The day or two before 
um, they were killed. My dad said he was walking down the road with Soph, my sister Sophie, and somebody pulled up next to him going, Ellis, we're going to get you. Or some, I don't know, some words, whatever. There was, there was shit all the time. So it was just constant pressure, constant stress, as if people mm. were getting backed into a corner with the only way is to come out swinging themselves. Mm. How was it when you heard Pat had died? Was there any emotion? Did you feel any regret? That I couldn't, I couldn't. No, I, I remember Pat, we were good friends. I remember phoning him up after I shot him. And we was talking. <laughs> we was talking. And then he started, he started, I went, and I said, Pat, sorry I shot you. It was nothing personal. I think I said nothing personal. It's just that you and Tony you had to get me. So then we had a massive argument and I didn't talk to him again. <laughs> yeah. Because even, I how, thought you might forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> how, speaking about it all, Steve, how, how mentally draining is it? It's draining. Because you can see the emotion in your face that it's, it's some serious stuff. You'll need to live with that pain for the rest of your days, obviously. It's 25 years deep now, all this stuff, and it's still getting brought up. It's still getting spoke about. There's still films, there's still books. It's like you can never just close the chapter on it or close the full book on it. Is that hard? My, my dad died of cancer, right? Sorry to hear that. Mm, so he had three lots of cancer. How much did that affect him? I don't know. My granddad died of cancer. He fell off a roof. And apparently that... And he had stress with his my aunt. And my mum believes that's what killed my granddad. The fall off the roof and the stress of like, the argument with him, which would have been my aunt, his daughter. So how much did the stress that my dad had to put up with of seeing him pieces of shit? We've all got cancer in us. We've all got the cancer of cells. Yeah. It just takes something to trigger it. So was the stress that I put my family, unintentionally put my family through, did that trigger any of the, my, my, dad, my dad had cancer of the throat, got treated for that. He had cancer of the backside, the skin, his, his, his anal passage, his bum, whatever. He got treated for that. Then he had stomach cancer, and stomach cancer and bone cancer killed him. And three times through my dad's treatment, I had to watch a man become a, a skeleton who, who was crying because he was in pain. I had to watch that. So did, did all the shit that I cause trigger the cancer of cells in my dad? All the shit, even if it didn't, like all the crap, all the fear of who was coming round. My sister, Sophie, was five. five. Donnie was 14 or 15. And my stepmom, he had to look after them. I had to look after them. And then this crap still comes up. How's your head been the last 25 years? What have, what's life been like after it for you? Has um, it been tough or did you feel a big bit of stress and pressure off you when that happened? Or did it come tenfold again? I don't know. I nah. can't, I can't. I just, you know, How's life just, now? Could be better, I could have more money. <laughs> Get a book out. <laughs> uh, yeah, but... <laughs> You know, I, I just, I work for a living, it's shit. Do you feel it easier though? Like, don't have to look over your shoulder and worry, stress, doing bad shit. Look at the pain and the trauma it causes. Everything has that ripple effect. When I was young, like I said, I can't have kids. Mm -hmm. I can't have children. I, something I've lived with, I always wanted my dad to be the donor if I was going to have children. Um, unfortunately, when he got cancer of the bum, they cooked him through the front which left him sterile. And I was like, in my selfishness, I thought, well, Dad, you can't be the donor for me to have children. Um, so I, whenever I lived, when I was banged up, I didn't want visits. I didn't want people coming. To, I, I'll get on with my bird. I'm nicked, I banged up, put me on the Isle of Wight, I've been on there a couple of times, I'll do my bird there. I don't want visits, they do your head in. So I never had anyone that relied on me. I accepted. I just, look, you, it's dog eat dog. If I went out with a gun, didn't shoot anyone because <laughs> if I did that'd be wrong it's wrong going out with a gun right so that was a toy gun yeah so I went out and robbed drug dealers yeah if I got caught tortured and killed tough shit if I got banged if I got caught with a gun and got banged up tough shit it's my thing I've got to do the time yeah so but now I've got a girlfriend she's got children one of them I'm not going to say her name she, she's like a daughter to me I'm very lucky I'm very lucky the girlfriend I've got and one of her youngest daughter so now I've got somebody who gets, so that's why I work for a living. So I, I'm responsible for someone. I look after two people. Responsibility. Yeah. And I've got, as she says, I've got a daughter, which I'm very lucky. For anybody watching, Steve, that's maybe wanting to go down a life of crime or what it, be a bad man, what advice would you give for them? <laughs> you ain't got a clue. You ain't got a clue. Because, um, how can I explain it? 
who, who, can t- who can tell a teenager anything? Like let's say, if you want to know anything, ask a teenager. When you're in your 20s, what do you know really? Nothing compared to when you're in your 30s. If you want to go down a life of crime, you, you've got no idea what the future holds. You know, I mean, look at the misery you cause your family. Look, look, at what, look, what, look at what could happen to you. Do you want your family, do you want your mum and dad coming to visit you on a slab because you've been stabbed or you've been shot? Your family's got to miss you because in your selfishness, you went out and, commit, you went out and got involved in crime. It ain't gonna, it's not worth it. Very few people, very, very few people. People I know, people I know, there's a lot of them dead. There's still a few banged up. But no one I know has got away with it. You've got to find it. But then if, you, if you're living a life of crime and the money's coming in, it's easy, a nice big wad from God. It's easy, you've got wad from God, wad from God. Well, not God, obviously, you know, from whoever. Go and rob someone. But that wad runs out. And then you've got a future in front of you and you're not gonna, it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. Unless you're very lucky. I don't know anyone who's, who's had a life of crime, and I'm talking about different crimes, right, who's got away with it. People do. But you don't hear about them. You don't know who they are. Yeah. What do you think of looking back at your life now, Steve? In regards to... When you're speaking about it, just from 10 years old, cancers, leukemias, trying to kill life. people, just going through it. Do you think, fuck me, man, what a, my only, what a roller my coaster only that is. Are, my only regrets, I didn't kill them. Mm-hmm. I didn't talk to them and kill them. They're my regrets. Do you think people you could have lived with that? Yeah. Killing a man? Yeah. I tried to, and I'd do it again if they, they'd threaten my family. You know, all these people go, oh, yeah, family counts, family counts. What a load of crap. You know, I ain't going to sit there and say that. Yeah, you've, do you know what? I'm closest to Lee. He's, my, he's, my, he's a very good friend. Another very good friend, Badger. They're, they're my family. Yeah, shout out to Lee Mayo. But for coming on today, Stephen, telling your story, I can see the emotion in your face. Obviously, it's a lot of deep, dark stuff, but you've come out of it. You've got the daughter now, and you're doing things, and you're working hard. Yes, I can see you've still got the boy's nature with your shite jokes and... <laughs> what do you mean, laugh. shite? <laughs> <laughs> Try to laugh it off. But good jokes. <laughs> for, um, for coming on this day, Steve, oh, and giving me your time, I very much appreciate it and God bless you and look forward to seeing what you're doing for the future. Hope you earn loads more money out of this <laughs> and remember me. Yeah, 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 I won't, yeah, yeah. mate, I won't. Next time I'll pay you. <laughs> yeah, all right, yeah, all right, okay. <laughs>